Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome today and introduce our panelists on behalf of the Hellenic Bankers Association in London. It's a joint event with the London School of Economics uh, and the Hellenic Observatory of the LSE. And it's also my personal honor because uh, I have been also uh, an, um, I've been at the LSE and a graduate as well. Our distinguished panelists today are Professor Charles Goodhart, is a Professor Emeritus of Banking and Finance at the LSE. Professor Goodhart is a Director of the Financial Regulation Research Program. He's been an economist and a member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee from June 97 to 2000. And also he's been a Professor of the London School of Economics. Professor Goodhart has made an important contribution in the debate and research on the European Union issues, which we're living through today and affect everybody's daily life. Uh, his uh, specialty has been monetary policy, and he's been involved with financial stability, <coughs> being an advisor to the government of, uh, of uh, Bank of England for the years 2002 to 2004. Our other distinguished uh, guest today is Professor Michael Chalyasos, he holds a chair for microeconomics and finance at the Goethe uh, University in Frankfurt. He's currently director of the Center of Financial Studies. Professor Haliasos received a BA from Cambridge University and a PhD in economics from Yale uh, University in 1987. He has spent some time at the University of Cyprus as well and such as the Cypriot experience that we're going through at the moment is topical in today's Cyprus events. Uh, Mr. Chalyasos' research interests lie in microeconomics and finance with emphasis on household finance. On this event, he is uh, advisor to the ECB on, uh, and he's uh, specifically on the household fin uh, finance survey at the moment. Uh, Last but not least, obviously, is Daniel Gross. He's a director of uh, the Center of European Policy Studies, which is a European think tank from the mid-1980s. His current research primarily focuses on EU economic policy, specifically on the impact of the euro on capital and labor markets, as well as on the national role of the euro, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. Professor Gross was born and raised in Germany. He attended the University of Rome and received a Laura in Economy and Commercial. He also has received a PhD in Economics from the University of Chicago. Previously, he has worked for the International Monetary Fund and served as economic advisor to the European Commission from 1988 to 1990, and has served also as an advisor to the European Parliament. would like also to introduce uh, Mr. Kevin, uh, Professor uh, Kevin Featherstone is a moderator with whom for many years uh, has nurtured the Hellenic Observatory. He spent his autumn term as a visiting professor at Harvard University and we're happy to see him back. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, for the format for the debates, I'm going to invite uh, each of our distinguished speakers uh, to speak for perhaps a maximum of 15 minutes, uh, if that's okay. And then there should be plenty of time for uh, discussion. And we're going to go in the order uh, of the original uh, program. So I'm going to invite uh, Charles Goodhart to begin. Uh, now, I noticed, Charles, that I believe you were on the Wilson Prize Committee, a committee established uh, to give a prize uh, to the person who came up with the best strategy for how to exit the euro. Strangely topical, one would think, you know, this evening. Charles, would you like to begin our discussion? Um, yes, I <coughs> would just like to mention that the person who led the Wilson Committee was a lovely economist called Derek Scott, who very sadly, in the course of providing that prize, um, died of pancreatic cancer, which was a great loss to us all. Um, now, as I think all of you know, um, the problem about the possible uh, support for Cyprus has reached a very interesting, possibly delicate stage. Um, and there are very close relationships, very obviously, uh, between Cyprus and Greece, and what may happen to 
Greece may well be affected in certain ways that I think are difficult to predict by what is happening to Cyprus. So, uh, with your permission, rather than starting by talking about Greece, I'd prefer to start by talking about Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus first asked for uh, financial support as long ago as June last year. Uh, its two main banks, uh, Popular and the Bank of Cyprus, uh, naturally held a sizable volume of Greek bonds. And when the uh, private sector involvement, or PSI, uh, <coughs> occurred, uh, the value of these bonds fell very sharply. Um, and with other problems in Cyprus and Greece, uh, the banks were running into difficulties. <coughs> there was a general agreement to put off the negotiations um, until after there was a change of government uh, in Cyprus uh, because the, the previous president um, was not only communist but was putting on certain preconditions uh, which the Troika were unprepared to accept. Now as you know once the new president came into office uh, the negotiations moved forward quite swiftly um, and uh, primarily for uh, local political German reasons, uh, some of the northern states were not prepared uh, to provide funding for Cyprus um, unless there was a significant contribution uh, primarily from the depositors of the Cypriot banks, which were characterized uh, in the northern press uh, and I have no personal ability to assess the validity of the characterization um, as representing uh, money laundered, uh, Russian monies uh, from oligarchs and others with more or less uh, ethical background. So, uh, the Troika was prepared to put up uh, something of the order of 10 billion but required another 6 billion uh, from effectively from the depositors in the banks. Uh, my understanding, and here I'm an outsider and I have no reason uh, to, I, I have no grounds for this view, but I've heard it said, um, that the Cypriot negotiators um, felt that their sort of business model um, and the future of the banking industry in Cyprus and their connections with Russia, which have been quite considerable, uh, would have prevented uh, an expropriation or levy or tax, whatever you want to call it, of greater than 10% on the deposits of the uninsured depositors. If you then did the arithmetic um, and worked out what the effect of the 10% haircut of uninsured depositors. To meet the six, the six billion that the Troika required from the overall deposits of the uh, Cypriot banks, required there to be an additional levy of 6.5% on the insured depositors. Now my understanding is that the Troika insisted on the levy from the uh, Cypriot banks, but allowed the Cypriots themselves to decide on how the levy should be distributed among the various bank creditors, with the uh, unsecured senior bondholders being so small in number uh, and in amount that they really weren't worth, worth counting. Um, and since it had been said that uh, <coughs> um, there were great dangers in bailing in the senior bondholders in the Irish and other cases, that it wasn't worth the tiny amount that would be raised from them. Well, anyhow, um, you saw what then happened uh, when it was announced that there was to be the levy, 6.5%, even on the insured depositors. It effectively made it perfectly clear uh, <coughs> that the deposit insurance, uh, which was generally thought to be a key element in maintaining the single financial market uh, within Europe, within the Eurozone, that your deposit was as safe 
whether if it was insured, whether you held it in Portugal or Finland, um, that this was now put in jeopardy. And there was an immediate <coughs> sort of, sort of backwash. You know, we, we shouldn't have done that. We shouldn't have allowed that. Whoever was responsible for trying to do it. So that the, the initial terms of the bailout are now subject to very considerable reconsideration. Uh, it's very unlikely, in my view, that the Troika will agree to ease the overall terms by putting up more European money. <coughs> now, they would therefore want more money from Cyprus. The question is, how is Cyprus going to get it if they are not going to be, have a haircut on the uninsured depositors? What happened then, or is happening now, is that the Minister of Finance, Michael Saris, who my recollection, and I'm getting rather old, uh, was that he was actually one of my students at LSE <laughs> uh, back in 19, uh, when I was here first in 1965-1968. As I recall, he was a very good student. And um, anyhow, he has gone over to Russia. Now, the interesting issue here is that the amount of money needed effectively to deal with the Cyprus situation is in terms of a large country, and Russia is a large country with very large foreign exchange reserves, is it minimal. The Russians could easily, effectively bail out the whole of Cyprus, even if the ECB took its money out. They could simply put the money back in again. And as some of you may have already heard, there is an as yet unconfirmed statement or rumor uh, published on Bloomberg's earlier this afternoon, that Russian private investors are prepared to buy and presumably recapitalize Laiki or the popular bank. And there are other things that Russia could do as well. Uh, Russia could give uh, Cyprus a loan of whatever size Cyprus needs, which could be hypothecated or collateralized against the future revenues uh, from the oil, gas, shale, large deposits which are believed to leave to be off Cyprus, which the Cypriots, in fact, would actually, um, in some ways, welcome, uh, because the extraction of this oil and gas from this shale field is being hindered by Turkey, which is saying, you're not going to do anything until we have made an agreement, and the Turks have the power to do that. But if the Russians come in on behalf of the Cypriots, and the actual exploration vessels and the drilling platforms are Russian, the likelihood of the Turks being prepared to up the level of dip diplomatic agro to actually start, if you like, firing on a Russian vessel uh, would be quite difficult to, to imagine. So that there are lots of ways in which Russia, if it wanted to, effectively could bail out Cyprus and make Cyprus into something much closer to a vassal state. The question is then, what would the EU and the Troika do about that? What would be the position if Russia effectively bailed out Cyprus and became Cyprus's protector? Would the ECB, for example, regard a Russian purchase of the Cypriot banks as providing them with a fit <coughs> set of banks? Would the EU and the Americans like it if the Cypriot banking system became totally Russian dominated? Or if in effect the oil gas exploration and extraction effectively became from gas prop? So that the developments that may occur are a fascinating interaction between Russia, the Troika, and if you like the, e the Eurozone, the EC, the ECB, with America having an interest if Russia gets involved, um, and Cyprus itself. And what comes out of this? Very, very difficult to, to see. But the diplomatic dance that may occur uh, between Russia and Europe, and note that the Russians were fairly furious at being excluded from the discussions between the Troika and Cyprus no part. So Putin would, I think, find it extremely attractive, effectively, to put one up over the EU and the Troika, 
effectively by saying, look, we'll put up the money, but we want Cyprus to remain within the Eurozone. So that Russia, in effect, would have a subsidiary state within the Eurozone. What does the Eurozone then do about that? Interesting question. Let me turn, however, finally to Greece. Um, now, I think that the Greece, Greek developments may be affected by what happens to Cyprus. I want to give you sort of an analogy, uh, which I think is a, a valid one in the Greek case. Um, a frog can always jump out of water. Now, if you wanted to boil a frog in order to obtain frog's legs, how do you actually go about it? Well, what you don't do is you don't drop a frog into boiling water because it would immediately get cut and jump right out. So what you do if you want to boil a frog is you put a, a frog into actually rather lukewarm tepid water. And it's always going to be a cost in effort and energy to jump out. So what you do is you turn up the heat very, very slowly. And at any point in time, the frog thinks to itself, well, it's just a tiny bit worse than it was before. <laughs> But it's still just as horrible to jump out. And eventually, the heat gets turned up and up and up, and eventually you get boiled frog. Well, what has happened is you've got boiled grease. <laughs> because what effectively occurred is that each time there was a, what about, a bailout procedure, the, what are the terms got and the conditionality got made a little bit tougher and a little bit tougher. And at each time, the relative cost of jumping out of the euro appeared to be a great deal worse than taking just a little bit more of the same stuff. But had you realized in sort of May 2010 that the implication of going down the austerity line would be 25% and rising unemployment, 50% and rising youth unemployment, and a cut in incomes and output of greater than, I think, virtually any country suffered in the 1929-1933 depression, would you have actually been prepared to go down that route? And I think the answer was that you were like the frog. You were kept on, or rather the Greeks were like the frog. They kept on thinking you know, a little bit more and again, one of the problems here is that whenever you, these things are suggested, you know, the austerity will do you good. The people who set them up and the politicians who agree to them actually believe, and they have to believe, you, you, know, you can't do this thing unless you have belief in it. Um, they believe that it will be the last, but it never has been, and it's unlikely to be. So, but, you know, we still have the problem that either you're going to jump out of the euro, which would be absolutely horrible and would require default, or you stay in and stay on with the conditionality and austerity, which will just grind the face of the Greek economy and the Greek people further and further down. And what's more, the situation has actually worsened in many ways, uh, in some part, uh, because of what has happened to the banking system, for example, the banks are effectively held up uh, by uh, in injections of funds through T2 and the ECB, <coughs> so that the Greek banking system is effectively entirely dependent on the ECB. That means that certain measures which might have been taken at the outset, for example, the kind of new currency regime that Dimitri Somakos and I had actually suggested in the spring of 2010, are effectively, I think, beyond possibility now. Because the ECB wouldn't like it. And the ECB is now in effectively in a position to veto virtually anything. The only alternative is if you want to get out of the grips of the ECB, is effectively uh, to uh, leave the Eurozone um, and recapitalize the Greek banking system by effectively putting in um, Greek bonds in the there are one or two of the constraints on the Greek decision making which are a bit eased because until very recently you did not have the primary surplus and that meant you would have had to cut immediately quite severely more if you left the euro because no one would have lent you. 
now you are approaching, or Greece is approaching primary sectors, and therefore is in a position where it could actually take or jump out of the, uh, the hot water, the boiling pot, with possibly slightly less uh, implications. Now, it's a very nasty decision, and one can see why uh, Greece has behaved like my frog in boiling water. To leave the euro would be absolutely horrible in many ways. And it would lead to default both of the government and of the um, much of the private sector. And to do that, consciously to, to advocate that, is probably something that is almost still politically impossible in Greece. On the other hand, if you stay where you are, you will die like my frog. You will get boiled. You have a long way down towards being boiled. And it is an extraordinarily uncomfortable situation. Um, and I wouldn't like to be in a position to take the to have to take the choice between jumping out of the boiling water, possibly into an extraordinarily hot frying pan for a time, or staying where I am and getting boiled. Is, like the Irishman said, I wouldn't have started from here, but that's where we are, um, and um, I wish it were not so. Thank you, Charles, very much for getting us off to such a positive, optimistic uh, <laughs> note. Uh, clearly, we have a number of things to uh, discuss. Uh, Charles has mentioned about the historical exceptionalism of the Greek debt. Uh, and the size of the recession. Our next speaker, D Daniel, wrote an interesting op-ed in the Financial Times <coughs> in December, uh, which was before the latest bailout was negotiated. And the headline was that Greece does not need debt forgiveness. Please speak to this audience. Okay, thanks. Give me a signal after. OK, OK. I should improvise whilst it goes to the lecture. Um, I think, uh, sorry, good afternoon. And Nice to be here. I, while Charles was speaking, I thought this gives a perfect. Sorry, no touch the wrong button. F5. F5. Gives a perfect uh, starting point for my own presentation, which is to say that actually, the fiscal adjustment is not the key issue, and uh, the fiscal adjustment was not raised <coughs> by. You had this huge recession in Greece. Um, what was much more important was the extraordinarily bad export performance. And uh, the key issue for Greece is not so much the public debt, but the foreign debt. You can devalue, introduce a new currency and devalue to death. Foreign debt doesn't change. And if you think, OK, devaluation and default or foreign debt is the same thing, then I would say you just default on your foreign debt, no need to have the new currency. That doesn't really change anything on top of that. Um, and then I want to sit, ask myself, is it really unacceptable what, what Greece had to endure? Right? Is it really boiled to death? And then I ask myself now, why is that actually happening in Greece? Um, and I hope to do that all 15 minutes. Okay. So, external adjustment, uh, I think that's the key. What Greece had was were huge current account deficits, which means capital inflows, and there's a sudden <coughs> stop. Greece is not the first country to have that, and many countries have that, and what happens then is usually you have to stop importing, because taking exporting takes more time, um, and that's how the economy goes down. Actually, in the case of Greece, the sudden stop was much delayed because of the ECB financing available. So Greece was actually much better off than the Baltic countries, for example, which had to adjust within 18 months. Right? So they, they were, could have been jumped out of the water. They didn't. They had fixed exchange rates. So they, they were economically in the same situation as, as, as if they had to be in the Eurozone, minus liquidity support from the ECB. Now, it took a long time, but actually it is now actually close to being achieved. The current account is turning. Um, and the legacy, of course, of this slow adjustment is that you have a large amount of foreign debt. 
and that was not much diminished by the PSI. Let me just first of all say, uh, by the way, just on Cyprus, it's a similar problem. Cyprus, my view is again, not so much the public debt in the banks. The key thing is this integral which you see here under the current account, uh, which is, I think, about 80-90% of today's GNP, GDP, probably 100% of tomorrow's GDP, and which is the foreign debt of the country which somehow has to be served, whether it's owed by the government or by the banks, doesn't really matter. Let me come to Greece. So this is what happened. You had huge capital inflows or current account deficits, and the accumulated foreign debt this way was worth about uh, 340 billion euros, which is more than the annual GDP of the country. That's the crux of the problem. And you see that the current account uh, adjusted here in this compressed series rather quickly, but if you start the crisis in 2009, you see that we are now in 2012, there's still a large deficit, and even for 2014, it is not predicted to be to have fully turned. The direction is right, but the path is not quick, it's very small. If I had put you Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, you would see that they are even further down the red, and within two years, they go into surplus. So, okay, that's the slow increase of the temperature that you have, um, which of course makes the integral under the curve larger and more foreign debt. And that, of course, uh, leads a legacy. And that's why you continue to have problems in the market access. Because if you look at the sovereign spreads uh, uh, by, by country today, then you see that it's very closely related to the amount of foreign debt. Now, Paul Grauer sit in the, sits in the audience who has done a lot of econometric tests on the short-term variations of uh, these uh, spreads. And they have been enormous. They've been going up and down. And the macroeconomic variables don't move that quickly. So in the short term, there's been a lot of volatility in the markets and perhaps some irrationality as well. But I would submit to you that on average, and once you have markets which have calmed a little bit down, then you still see a, 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 a link between the accumulated current account of the foreign debt of the country and the remaining uh, spreads. And I think that is the difficulty of the country. Uh, it has somehow to service its foreign debt. The domestic, sorry, the, the, the public debt it's domestic, it doesn't really matter. It's from one pocket to another, um, and really doesn't affect the, the net consumption possibilities of the country as such. Now, I said earlier that the, fist, that the adjustment has been so costly in Greece. First of all, let me make one point, which is for people who have looked at the details now. There was an extraordinarily rapid uh, derapage of the Greek public finances during the election year 2009. There was a peak there. So if you measure the adjustment from the peak 2009 to 2010, 11, 12, it's very high. If you take the, the year just before and measure the adjustment, then the adjustment's actually not that big. So you basically had one year excessive expenditure, which was taken back partially next year, and everybody says, ah, this huge fiscal adjustment. I think you have to be very careful where you set the baseline. And if you take the pre-election uh, madness uh, out, then the adjustment has not been that, that quick. Um, but the key thing, I think, is that in the case of Greece, you didn't have any offset from exports. The other peripheral countries also had to undertake fiscal adjustments, but the negative demand effect of that was partially offset by an increase in exports. In Greece, exports actually fell. That, for me, is difficult to understand. <laughs> Prices went down, costs went down, demand for tourism and so on readily fall. Why did Greek exports fall? Anybody has a, has, a, has a good reason why I am a taker. Okay, so if you look at the, uh, the GDP sacrifice you have to have for a current account. Here I've put you the Baltics, which are in the lower left, right-hand corner, and then the other peripherals further up to the left. And you see that's a pretty strong relationship between the size of the external current account adjustment and the drop in GDP which is natural, as I said earlier. For one or two years, difficult to have an uh, increase in exports, a large one, so in the first instance, demand <coughs> goes down, GDP goes down. But you see that Greece is really an outlier. Now, why is it an outlier? Uh, I have done some very simple calculations. 
I've asked myself, where would Greece uh, domestic demand and GDP, be, sorry, not where would Greece uh, GDP be if it had had the same increase in exports as some other peripheral countries? Not huge, but a few percentage points of GDP plus, instead of a few percentage points of GDP minus, which was the case of Greece. And if you take the usual multiplier from the IMF, then you see that blue arrow, that brings you basically back to the line. So the key reason why uh, the situation is so bad in Greece is, in my view, not so much because of the fiscal adjustment was so bad, but because the exports just refused to grow. Actually, they fell. That's the key, that's the key problem and why the recession has been so strong and not the severity of the austerity and the slow tightening of the screws. It has domestic, it has domestic reasons. It's very often said the domestic adjustment is not acceptable. This is recession, this is depression style 1930s. So I do a very simple exercise. I look at the Greek consumption path, real consumption per capita, and I put it relative to Germany, where I put 2,000. What you see is actually that uh, Greek consumption has increased by much more than that in Germany, and that uh, it will reach German levels again in about 2012-13. So relative to 10 to 12 years ago, in Greece, consumption is now at the same level as in Germany. <coughs> so you put a German and Greek side by side, in terms of consumption flow today, they are in about the same relative position. One is considered unacceptable, politically, socially, whatever, and the other one, just normal, actually feels pretty good. Why? Because the derivative is different. The Germans feel good because now, finally, consumption is going up a little bit after 10 years of stagnation. And the Greeks feel extremely bad because consumption is falling after Bonanza, which lasted for about 10 years. So, and if you take actually the, the integral under the path, you see that the Greek is still much better off. He has had 10 years of party, and the Germans had 10 years of uh, cleaning up other, other people or paying for other people's party, and uh, now might be their turn. So that's why I think we be extremely careful in saying this is politically unacceptable, Greeks are being boiled to death, and this is recession, uh, depression style. Um, it is just uh, basically the country overconsumed for 10 years, and now, A, previous consumption level is not sustainable, so you have to ratchet it down. Secondly, if you want to pay for your debt, you have to go even lower. Like a family which took out lots of consumption credit <coughs> to sustain a high standard of living. First, the credit is being cut, so that already takes down what they can spend every month. And then people come and say, would you also like to pay interest? Okay, and the question might be yes or no, um, that's something else. And as I said, for, for, for Cyprus, you see a very similar development on the way up. And on the way down, I think these forecasts are much too, too optimistic. It will probably be Greek style. And again, it will be said, this is the fault of the Troika, this is the fault of the Germans, of the austerity. It's just basically because, if you look at the current account numbers, which I showed earlier, because the country was living above its mean, and that you cannot do forever, there's a budget constraint uh, in life, as you students of economics now. Okay, and then the final question for Greece. Uh, lots of reforms being promised, uh, very little implemented. I'm not just talk about the fiscal adjustment, but just the underlying uh, reforms in tax collection uh, and other things. And here, there's my second, I don't know whether it's a mystery, but observation which is that in Greece, uh, <coughs> the level of the quality of the governments today is really bad. Um, but, and that again is for me strange to, uh, uh, to, to, to understand, it has really fallen over the last 10 years, 12 years. Why this deterioration? I mean, if you take uh, 2000, the blue line and the green line, which were Greece and Estonia, we are at about the same level. <coughs> Estonia, which is about actually poorer than Greece, has had a slight improvement. And in Greece, uh, it has basically trended downwards. 
And that, I think, is the second problem of the country. This is, my view, the reason why uh, the reforms don't work, why the economy doesn't respond to relative prices quickly, uh, and why it's very difficult, I would say impossible, to reform anything in increase from Brussels. People from Brussels can just go to the, to the Greek parliament and say, please pass this law and this law and this law. They cannot go down in the administration. You can do a fiscal adjustment with 10 people, the finance minister and some others, but you cannot reform a public administration unless you have the support of 10,000, perhaps 100,000 people, bureaucrats at all levels. That is the problem, the key problem which I see for Greece. That is a problem, not austerity. Austerity just means that you live in your budget constraint. Uh, how well you live depends on how well you organize yourself at home. Uh, by the way, if you look at, uh, at one country which is very close to Greece, Bulgaria, you see that uh, that's a country which is even poorer. You see there was a large difference in economic governance between the countries that has now converged. But you see you can be poor and corrupt and still fiscally stable. So that's a little bit the, uh, the future I see, unfortunately, for the country, for Greece. It might be fiscally stable, but given the level of corruption and other governance indicators, it might not grow much and might just uh, stay permanently at a, at a much lower level of both production and, of course, then also consumption. So my point of view is, uh, the boiling frog uh, is uh, wrong as an analogy. Um, you had a sudden stop in, in capital flows mitigated by the ECB, uh, which unavoidably had to lead to a recession as part of the GDP beforehand was just not sustainable. Uh, the depth of the recession was due of the inability of the country to export, for which there's really no reason because the lack of capital was not the reason. <coughs> in tourism, the hotels exist. Everything exists, just uh, people don't come. You don't need capital to have more, more guests in your, in your hotel. Um, the fall in consumption, uh, saying that it's totally unacceptable uh, politically and socially, in my view, is a bit difficult to sustain when you look at other countries in Europe which had a much lower consumption path. And finally, the key challenge is really domestic. It is reform of the system of the country. And that can be done only by the Greeks themselves, not from Brussels. Thank you very much. Well, I was hoping our uh, speakers would disagree with each other, and I think uh, they're fulfilling that task wonderfully well so far. Um, there's absolutely no pressure, Michali. It's simply that we have two cogent cases that uh, Greece is boiled in the water and it's um, something unpleasant out of the water. And in any event, uh, Greece um, is so beset by governance problems it can't get out. No pressure. Over to you. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, well, first of all, thanks very much um, for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, we have uh, quite a few things that uh, we agree on, actually surprisingly uh, many things that we agree on, although I will try to give maybe a little bit uh, of a different uh, shade. Uh, but uh, maybe I get to answer the, the puzzle of uh, Daniel, uh, you know, how come exports uh, fell and how come the country uh, cannot um, get out of its uh, current account deficits, uh, etc. And uh, I'm not going to start with a frog, but um, I am going to, to start with a parable. Uh, so so let's, uh, let's see how we do. So I thought uh, you know, I would summarize my view of uh, what's going on uh, by alluding to a uh, family. So suppose that uh, you have a poorer uh, cousin uh, who has mishandled uh, opportunities, uh, gotten into a lot of uh, debt. Uh, you have uh, lent to him, but he cannot repay you, and he has borrowed from others, and he cannot repay others. He has potential, but he cannot get his act together. 
he comes to you and he says, um, I can't pay back my loans, help me. So what do you do? So um, option number one is you forgive him. Uh, you give him all the liquidity he needs, uh, in other words, uh, all the money. You stand ready to give him more in the future because he's family. Okay. And, uh, you know, I don't know how silly this sounds, but uh, I'm amazed at uh, how much I read uh, things like this and I hear things like this, uh, even with increase in the political dialogue, uh, but sometimes uh, also outside. Option number two is much uh, longer, so what you do is uh, you look in his pockets for money, okay? Uh, he has just come to you to say he doesn't, uh, cannot repay you. You make him go through the attic and sell the family silver. You give him some money uh, to meet his current obligations, but make him come back every week uh, for more, to beg for more. Every time he comes, he has to bring uh, more funds to the table. You make sure others who lent to him in the past also contribute. Okay, so you're not the only one who does something. You force him to consolidate so as to cut current costs, even if the consolidations are not optimal for the longer run. You, can, you convince him he has to work for peanuts if he is to ever find a job. You push him to deliver on every visit, so he doesn't actually have time to look for a good job. All he does is how, uh, you know, think how to get the next uh, fix, the next installment. But he cannot, does not have time to look for a job. And then option number three is very short. You help him and force him, if needed, to get organized and to get a good high paying job so that he is able to start paying you back. Okay. And of course, in the context of that, you help him shape up, uh, you know, cut back on uh, unnecessary expenses, etc. But the main focus and the main objective is to get him to get, uh, to find a high paying job <coughs> so that he can. Uh, pay you not only today but also in the future. So that's my parable. Now how do I translate uh, this? I think the EU and the Eurozone and my uh, good colleagues and friends, the, the Germans where I work, you know, I'm a Greek in Germany. <laughs> I'm an economics professor. You know, this is almost an impossible uh, combination. Okay. They need to stop asking, you know, who pays, because this is an obsession. Uh, this is, I mean, it's not an unjustified obsession, but it is an obsession. Who pays uh, for the Greeks, you know, who pays for, uh, for these debts, etc. And to start asking who earns, you know, who earns so that he can repay us uh, in the future. Squeezing payments out of Greece has gone too far economically and politically. Uh, without the necessary or the desirable effects, and boosting productive and export potential has been largely ignored. And this is where I, I fully uh, agree with Daniel that the key problem is really uh, creating a productive sector uh, that uh, can export. Okay. Now, let me uh, tell you a little bit about you know taxing, etc. Now. Daniel showed us consumption, and he was very happy to, to show us that Germans consume as much as uh, Greeks. So here I'm showing you net wealth, and I'm very happy to show you that Germans are much, uh, that uh, Greeks are much richer than Germans. Okay. So um, what am I doing here? Too many numbers, but I just highlighted two um, two things. These are data for older households, 50 plus. I can assure you I'm, I'm a bar good. Uh, I cannot uh, talk about data on the overall population. It's coming out from the ECB, uh, maybe at the end of March, maybe by mid-April. Uh, uh, I cannot say anything except that these figures are not misleading for what you're going to see for the entire population as well, which is that uh, if you look 
at the 25th percent, the person who is the household that is at the 25th percentile of the net wealth distribution, the median, and then the 75th percentile of the net wealth distribution. And you look, uh, and these are comparable figures, thousands of euros, purchasing power parity, adjusted, uh, etc. You see that, um, you see that uh, median net wealth, household net wealth in Greece in 2007 before the crisis was very comparable to that uh, in uh, Germany. And at the lower uh, part of the distribution, uh, the, the 25th percentile, uh, the Greek household had about three times the net wealth that the German household had. And um, even at the, you know, among uh, richer households, 75th percentile of the distribution, the difference is not that big. And if you think, you know, I'm highlighting Greece because we're talking about Greece, but if you think that, uh, you know, Greeks are the only ones who behave like that, look at Spain, look at Italy, uh, so, you know, pigs are doing pretty well, right, um, in terms of net wealth. Now, what is the problem, you know, wh why is that? It is because of uh, real estate. Uh, it is because Mediterraneans tend uh, to have accumulated quite a bit of real estate. And, uh, you know, the straight comparison requires a lot of thinking, what to make of it, etc. I don't want to talk about the comparison between Greece and Germany, but I want to to, uh, in terms of the level of net wealth. But I want to show you how much of this uh, net wealth that uh, Greek households have is in home equity, that is equity in the primary residence, and how much is in real estate equity in total. So uh, you look at the 25th percentile, 65,000 uh, euro, of which 59.4 thousand are in real estate. So you have a very small cushion uh, of liquidity uh, to squeeze out of these people if you tax them, uh, if you throw them into a recession, uh, if you lower their wages, etc. Compare and contrast the German uh, in the 25th percentile of the distribution, 21 thousand, no house, no real estate, 21,000 euro in liquid assets, uh, in, in assets that are, you know, much yeah, more liquid than uh, real estate. And then you go to the, uh, you go to the median of the distribution and you find about 8,000 euro in liquid assets uh, in Greece. And of course, uh, much bigger amounts uh, in Germany. So this is... The, the issue of, this is before the crisis, so how much can you squeeze out of these people uh, through recession and through taxes? Then a lot of discussion on competitiveness. Uh, if you read, uh, and also you know, very uh, prominent um, scholars, uh, including German scholars, uh, arguing about unit labor costs, you have to starve, you have to lower wages because otherwise you're not competitive. So here are um, changes in the ECB Harmonized Competitiveness Index since 1999, uh, quarter one. And um, you look at all the Eurozone countries, and I'm afraid they are too small, but uh, there are only three countries that improved their competitiveness in terms since 1999, quarter one. Um, and the first one is Germany, and the second one is Greece, and the third one is uh, Austria. And all the rest have deteriorated in terms of this competitiveness index. How much nominal wages have to go down further in order for you know, Greek products to become competitive? It is not a problem of cost it, anymore. It is a problem of quantity. It is a problem that we don't produce anything. So, you know, cheaper thin air is still thin air. You cannot generate uh, a current account surplus. You cannot generate an increase in exports if you're not producing anything, or you're not producing much. And some sophisticated colleagues say, oh, you know, uh, your unit labor costs improved because you're in a recession, and in a recession you get rid of the least productive uh, industries and you concentrate on the most productive ones. But that's not what happened. Productivity dropped 
uh, since uh, 2000, uh, 2008 uh, in Greece and has been dropping consistently because there is labor hoarding and it is not that uh, you know, we, we got rid of the, of the least productive industries and, uh, and now the, the other ones could blossom, so to speak. That's not what's happening. So how do you move forward? Stop internal devaluation. It is mindless. Uh, don't get out of the euro, and I think you know, we agree with uh, all three. Increase in productivity. Greece is uh, uh, the first in uh, Europe in terms of a number of hours worked, and the 20th in terms of productivity. Uh, and uh, maybe you say too many coffee breaks. You know, people are at work and they get too many coffee breaks. But it's not just coffee breaks. It is also, you know, inability to get organized management. But it is also the time you have to spend to deal with a state which is inefficient and corrupt. Okay. So these things are, you know, the real culprits and the real margins where you can have uh, quite a bit of improvement. Uh, as opposed to trying to cut, uh, to cut costs and uh, completely demoralize people and get so many young people to leave the country now. Uh, it's not a matter of the level of consumption, it's a matter of prospects. And it's a matter of unemployment rates uh, among the young, which uh, are, uh, come close to 60%. So, you know, in those circumstances, you decide to leave uh, and you decide to go to Germany, actually. I hear a lot of Greek around me now in the university uh, because uh, many young people have left. And for the productive base, for the export base, you need reforms to promote ease of starting and doing business and to fight corruption. And here is where I uh, fully agree with Daniel and I would uh, elaborate. So we want an efficient smaller public sector, not for the sake of saving money, okay, that's good too, but for the sake of helping industry uh, develop, helping uh, the, uh, generate an efficient and export-oriented productive sector. Now, there was the question, and it, it was a very good question, how come you know, exports don't go up, how, much, how come you don't produce? There's a whole history, political history in Greece since uh, 1981. And the big story was not the deficit since 1981. It was an expansion of the public sector, a, a sort of trading of um, jobs, public sector jobs for votes that kept going on, right? An exchange of that form and a gradual uh, growth uh, of uh, you know allocations of funds of public funds, including EU funds, to party supporters. So if you start building you know your government and your party base on, uh, on that basis of of using funds uh, in order to uh, favor the people who support you and to uh, to get votes, then uh, gradually what happens is the private sector. Not only do you build a huge public sector, but the private sector itself figures out that if they are going to be able to engage in this exchange, they have to get into uh, sectors and into branches of activity where you can subsidize them. So they, so they got into public works. So the private sector, uh, you know, there were private sector companies doing public works and they were getting, you know, contracts uh, from the governments um, in exchange for support, for party support. So all the other productive sectors shrunk because the money was not there. The money was more uh, in the areas where you could, um, you could uh, benefit from public funds. So we have a very tiny productive sector. We need to rebuild or build the, the, the productive sector, and we have to have now the state supporting that uh, growth. Competition, uh, education, university education. If you go anywhere around the world, you find in any university, including, of course, the LSE, you find uh, Greek professors. I mean, we are everywhere. 
except for Greece. Right? It's amazing. You know, why don't we want to go back there? You know, what's going on? What is our problem that we cannot uh, establish a very productive and a very high quality uh, university system uh, in Greece to attract also foreign students to export, if you like, like the, the UK has been doing so successfully. So why don't, you know, what are the problems? Um, I'm going to come to, to corruption. Here is ease of doing business, uh, 2012 rank, 2013 rank, a little bit of an improvement, but look, we are still 78th in the world in terms of ease of doing business. And then, you know, I'm talking about starting a business and building a productive sector. Where are we there? 140th in the world in 2012, 146th in 2013. Okay, and if you look uh, at the, the last line, you know, paid in minimum capital, percentage of income per capita, it's 25% in Greece and it's 13% in the OECD. It is very difficult to start a business and it's very costly to start a business as a percentage of, uh, of income per capita. And then you have corruption. Corruption in 2008, Greece was 57th. Uh, in this uh, Transparency International uh, ranking. Where are we in 2013? 94th, okay? What other countries, who are our partners? <laughs> Colombia, Djibouti, India, Moldova, Mongolia, Senegal. Is this where, you know, the group of countries where you would normally put Greece? Now, what has happened? Have people become more corrupt? No. Be the the world has become, become more aware of our corruption. Corruption has been constant, but we have convinced everybody we are corrupt, okay? So that's the problem, right? But then you say, how are we going to get foreign investors uh, to, to set up businesses and to create a productive sector? Yes, I, I need to. Indicators for the justice system, 800 days to uh, enforce a contract the OECD average is 500 days. What can Greeks do? Is it only tourism? No, I'm not going to go through the list. It's a long list, right? It's a long list, but you have to support, you have to really um, uh, enable entrepreneurs uh, to, to function and to set up uh, industry. And finally, are there committed entrepreneurs in Greece, right? under all of these conditions. Look at this guy. <laughs> so who is this guy? I mean, uh, I don't know if you've been to Athens, but there are these kiosks in Athens, very small things where, you know, you can buy all of these little uh, things. So he owns a kiosk in Sidenma Square where all the demonstrations take place, right? <laughs> and there's all the tear gas, right? So what would a normal person do? Probably shut it down and move somewhere else. But he bought a gas mask, okay? <laughs> so that's the kind of spirit, you know, that we are talking about. It exists, but it needs to be fostered. Okay. Okay, I'm conscious that uh, we're going to run out of time, so I was again, is going to suggest that we go straight to questions and answers from the audience. And with your permission, I'm going to take three at a time. Uh, we'd like to, Paul, if you could wait for the microphone coming to you. I said, sorry, I said Paul de Graaf first, but it's first. Okay, okay, good. Uh, my question is, could you uh, introduce mandatory... I'm not sure the microphone is uh, with you. Could you introduce uh, mandatory retirement in Greece to enable uh, youth employment to go up? And um, also, how about global taxation, uh, since so many people who are doing well are living abroad? Okay. Can we... Global taxation. Global taxation. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to make two points to Daniel. Uh, we are good friends, but we couldn't disagree more. Um, let me first say a few things about your measure of the cost of recession. 
which is in the tradition of macroeconomics. How do you measure the cost of recession? Well, it's the decline of consumption. Right? That's the only variable that appears in these utility functions. In fact, you have labor in these utility functions, but labor has this utility. Therefore, if you go on taking leisure, your utility increases. So unemployment is just an exercise in taking leisure. So it seems to me that this is a very incomplete way to look at uh, the cost of a recession in, in uh, Greece. And if you had taken or shown the unemployment rates in Greece and in Germany, right, the same graph, you probably would have seen something different, right? And also a different perception of what the cost of a recession can be. And then I'm saying that when unemployment shoots up like it does in these countries, that creates risks and costs that are not in these mainstream models, right? It shakes societies, it destabilizes these societies. It's not in our macroeconomic models. And I think you are a little too cavalier in the way you treat the cost of a recession in Greece. And then to, to say that this has nothing to do with austerity seems to me to be one bridge too far. A second point I want to make has to do with the story you tell about the Greeks that have overspent, they're also corrupt, um, they have lived beyond their means, and therefore austerity is inevitable. They, they have to, to go through this, right? Inevitable if you have overspent, which of course is true. But your story is only half of the total picture. And that is that if there have been reckless debtors, and they're all in the southern countries, including Ireland, if I may add Ireland to southern Europe. Um, if there are reckless debtors, there must be reckless creditors. Right? They, are the, they are in the north of Europe. They are in, in Germany, in the Netherlands, and others. Right? They have made similar mistakes. Right? And now we are being told, well, it's those who are the debtors that have to adjust, and the creditors, since they have been virtuous, should not accept adjustment to make life easier for the system as a whole. And then I'm saying, you are telling only half of the story that is necessary here to deal with the problem. And in doing so, um, you, you reinforce what we observe today in Europe, that is that by pushing all the adjustment on the debtors, because they have been reckless, as we all know, and therefore they have to go to austerity, and others that have been equally reckless do not have to do much adjustment, then you create an environment that is now leading us into a new recession. And, and I would want to ask you to take a more balanced approach. Thank you. Perhaps one more. Take the gentleman at the back with his hand here, please. Could you just say who you are? I must thank all of the three speakers for fascinating, uh, penetrating insights on aspects of the Greek problem. One of the things that fascinates me about the Greek situation, which I don't know the answer to, is this. Uh, one of the dreadful things that was exposed was the degree of creative accounting that was going on in the government sector. I mean, public sector financing fixing of an extraordinary nature. Now, we now know from IMF research that a lot of this has gone on in other countries like France and Germany, Belgium, and <laughs> Britain. But um, really, it reached levels there in Greece, which okay. is quite extraordinary. So what's happened? Okay, good, thanks. Um, Daniel, do you want to... No, no, sorry. Shall we ask Charles to uh, comment on the points which have been raised, in particular about the uh, sense of uh, the magnitude of the recession and how we should understand that in the Greek case? Well, I was actually going to start with mandatory retirement. Um, <laughs> since I'm aged 76 and still working, I'm against it. <laughs> um, but I'm against it also for economic reasons. If you're going to have mandatory retirement, you've got a lot more people who are having to take out pensions to remain alive, and they're not producing anything, and they're not paying any taxes. 
So they're actually much more of a burden on the state if they are forced into retirement than if they're going on working like myself. And one of the few bright spots in the UK have been that increasingly over the last few years, a lot of people aged over 60 have been, going, have been continuing uh, to remain in the, in, in the workforce. Um, in terms of sort of overall macroeconomics, I'm, I'm very much with Paul. And make a couple of points on this one. The first one is that that diagram that Daniel showed about Germany and Greece, the problem actually is that the German consumption has been so low. We want Germany to party. We want Germany to increase their consumption. And as Paul says, one of the problems in all of this is that the burden of adjustment to misalignments has always been on the debtor countries. What we want is for the creditor countries like China and like Germany to undertake much more in the way of domestic expenditure. And what we should have seen is German consumption going up sharply in the last few years uh, with less austerity in Germany, more domestic consumption in Germany, which would have made the Greek problems considerably less severe. Then the next point I would make is that um, Daniel says that the problem with Greece is that it's the exports have not risen, and that's why GDP has been so low. Now, if you were listening to the Chancellor of the Exchequer this afternoon, you would have heard him say, word for word, exactly the same thing. The reason why the UK is growing so slowly is because exports have been growing so slowly. Why have exports been growing so slowly? because we export mostly to the EU, and the EU has austerity everywhere. It is actually very, or, or quite easy, to adjust your public sector position through austerity if you are the only country undertaking austerity, and everyone around you is growing quite fast. It actually, quite often, is beneficial under those circumstances. Canada did it, Denmark did it. The problem is not just austerity in Greece, it's austerity in, in Italy, it's <coughs> austerity everywhere. And if you get austerity everywhere, then inevitably your exports won't grow because the country you're trying to export will be also subject to austerity. So saying it's not austerity simply because the exports haven't grown simply disregards the fact that a common austerity program over the whole of the EU is in fact self-defeating. Thanks. Daniel. Okay, let me start with the last point. Sounds nice in theory. In practice, what happens? Um, I said all the other countries under pressure had actually increased their exports. How come Spain can increase its exports when Greece cannot? Spain exports to the same markets. Portugal, Italy, the Baltic countries. They all have quite dynamic exports. Despite what's called this austerity ridden Europe, only Greece has not. I'm saying Greece is an outlier. It's very important to say uh, the countries in the south, as a group, cannot export because Germany doesn't import enough, which I think actually is partly true. But as I repeat, Greece is an outlier in that group. In that group, the others have succeeded in gaining market shares and exporting more. Um, so I think that it's very important to keep in mind that really, as I repeat once more, this is, Greece is an outlier. That's my point. And if I can <coughs> say a few more about it, more goes again. Um, how to measure the cost of a recession? Okay. Let's leave that to the political scientists in the room. I just observe, and as economists, usually you have a budget constraint. And the budget constraint is usually constrained on your expenditure, not on your savings. Um, whether that's good or bad, and morally, I don't want to want to judge. And the same thing is, I did not talk about reckless debtors, reckless creditors. Um, if you have lived from additional capital, like your cousin, and after a while, perhaps the family father doesn't give you any more additional. Whether you pay his debt, that's something else, right? So, of course, it would be nice uh, if uh, Germany were to import more and consume more. I'm not against it. Uh, everything that can be done, but as you know, you can cut people with the access to credit, therefore they spend less. You can give them more money. There's no guarantee that they will actually spend it. It limits what governments can do. 
and uh, I think that's the point. And here, perhaps, I want to give the, the uh, introduction to, to him. I think the, the, the picture, the analogy I have is very good, but the point is, uh, if you are the uh, family father, this guy, this cousin, he lives on his own. You cannot go into his household and organize his day minute by the minute and force him to become more productive. You would like to, but he's adult. Member countries are sovereign in the EU. And therefore, all you can tell him, uh, if you don't shave up, you don't get money. But micromanagement is just not possible. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, starting with this uh, last point, uh, this was also made, this is also made by very uh, good uh, uh, colleagues, uh, German colleagues uh, of mine there who are well-intentioned uh, and everything. The problem is it has gone beyond that. I mean, you know, the, the idea is, you know, you have to fix it, basically. You know, we're not, not going to act uh, as gods and force you to fix things. But it has gone a little bit beyond that because the austerity, the pressure, and the, the constant pressure to change things and to um, restructure things uh, without even thinking, without even planning and uh, uh, optimizing, has been now counterproductive. It, it, it interferes with the process of establishing this productive uh, export-oriented base, and it has gone too far in, 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 that, um, in that respect. Um, I want to say um, something about, you know, I, I, however, we fully agree in terms of, you know, um, the export base not being there and, uh, uh, and that being a crucial uh, problem. Uh, and uh, with, without austerity, maybe it would have been even easier, but Greece is an outlier compared to the other countries because it does not have the, the companies uh, to produce, the, the private sector to produce it. It needs to rebuild it uh, because of this political problem. Mandatory retirement, if I may say something. Um, yeah, okay. So two things, two small things on mandatory retirement. One is um, I went to the Bank of Greece uh, in October to give a, co a seminar on Friday. On Wednesday, the new salary of the governor of the Bank of Greece had been announced. It was supposed to be 2,500 euro. Uh, between Wednesday and Friday, about 80 uh, top officials had um, retired, uh, had, uh, uh, you know, had left. Yeah, voluntarily because they wanted this year's, you know, last year's salary to count for the pension. Okay, so this is one way to have mandatory retirement. It's happening through wage cuts. The other thing is uh, the Troika insists on cutting uh, public sector uh, jobs. Uh, the politicians want to minimize the cost, the political cost, so they are always thinking of the old. Uh, so they are decapitating the public sector, uh, the civil service, by forcing the older people to uh, get out. Or, uh, okay. yeah. uh, perhaps uh, time for one last uh, round of questions. Can we take the lady just in front of you here, please? Hello. Um, thank you very much for your uh, speeches and comments. Uh, my name is Eri Bertz. I'm a, a PhD student in the government department. And I have a question for Mr. Gross and the whole of the panel, which is a bit more um, a point of criticism, perhaps, for the whole of the um, economic discipline. Because you said that you look at facts as an economist, but at the same time, you call the situation in Greece that not socially and politically unacceptable. But perhaps it, there is a, we've reached a point where economists, political scientists, and other sociologists should look at the whole picture and 60% youth unemployment or almost 60% youth unemployment is something that is socially unacceptable and uh, for historical reasons we should look at the bigger picture and what are your thoughts on that? Okay, good, thank you. Can you set the gentleman here? Please. Thank you very much. Uh, a question on behalf of uh, the Greek uh, society, the Hellenic Society, Student uh, Union of Elysee. Um, it was a really interesting analysis from all the speakers, but I think that we are a step forward. It's a stage of action. We have to take action, and uh, I don't want to be dramatic, but the history of Europe, or specifically South Europe, is formed during uh, these days. Uh, we have historical moments, 
uh, in Cyprus. I want to address specifically the problem of, of Cyprus and uh, to talk about the next day. And when I'm saying the next day, I mean the next day, tomorrow, that the banks are going to be closed once again. We cannot seriously believe that Troika raised the future of the European stability uh, just for 5.8 billion. We cannot really believe that uh, Troika decided to attack the holy coal of capitalism, which is the depositors, and uh, put into risk again the stability of the whole banking system of Europe and produce a collapse of the European uh, stock markets uh, two days ago. Okay. Uh, we, just for that, can we just take okay. this as a, as a comments and then okay. Kind of okay, okay, okay. Uh, I'll just address uh, the question. Of course, I have to say that as Greeks and Cyprus we recognize that we have done many mistakes, not only in as uh, the politicians. Okay. Can you give us a one sentence question? Okay. Or can we move on? My sentence, uh, my my question is whether you think that we have a real assistance to Cyprus or a revengeful strategy against Cyprus which leads to the, uh, to the devastation of the Cypriot banking system and what is going to happen in two days from now and how Europe, we are going to secure the idea of European stability. Okay, thanks. Uh, and you have the role to, pray, to play as prestigious thank people. You, thank you. Very generous. Okay, thank uh, you. The colleague here, please. Thanks. Um, could you say a bit about how um, changes to the structure of the European Union might provide a long-term solution to this? I'm thinking about um, a shared fiscal policy, for, for instance, and whether that could actually be part of the long-term solution. Okay. Uh, Michaelian, you want to start? So, um, I think this is going to be the last round. Yeah, yeah. So, revenge on Cyprus, etc. Um, one thing that uh, I have w witnessed in, uh, in uh, Germany is a very, very consistent line of thinking uh, from 2010 uh, up to here, uh, and that is an emphasis on moral hazard. It's not about Cyprus per se. Uh, no country should be taking it seriously. Uh, it is the emphasis of uh, Germans in particular on the issue of moral hazard. If we do this for one country, then the other countries will also do it. This is not the only possible consideration. Obviously, uh, we're killing the patient, uh, you know, with these uh, treatments. But this is a very consistent, um, you know, approach, and uh, we should not misinterpret any sort of German action as an act of aggression against a particular country or a particular set of uh, set of countries. Daniel. Two points. Um, youth unemployment, 60%. That 60% of those who are looking for a job, which are only 30% of their generation. So out of 100 youth, 18 are unemployed. Big number, but it has to be seen in the context. You will say maybe, ah, they're not looking for a job because they can't get one in the current recession. Not true. The percentage of the youth which has been looking for a job was this is approximately the same today as it was at the peak of the boom. So this is the problem, not so much the youth unemployment rate, which is completely overstating the problem, but the fact that already before, the structure was such that many were not either studying or, or, or looking for a job. Um, and then the question of European fiscal policy. Just imagine a European fiscal policy. We had one. First with the Greeks and, okay, you say the number falsifying we can be taken care of. But then take Italy. What do you do if you decide a fiscal policy in Brussels? You have a new election in Italy and the country says, the biggest party say, sorry, we think what you decided there is not good for our country. It kills our economy. We obviously need more expenditure. And they just do it. So I think uh, you can't have your cake and eat it. Either we have national sovereignty and national elections matter, or we have a European fiscal policy. We can't have both. Thank you. Charles, final word. Uh, conspiracies are extremely difficult to organize and usually blow up in the conspirators' face, whereas cock-ups are everywhere around. <laughs> um, and I have absolutely no doubt that there has been no conspiracy either to do down Cyprus or to do down uh, Greece, 
insofar as things have gone wrong, it's because of failures in understanding and simply getting things wrong. Um, now, the, the, the question of the, is there a, a longer term adjustment process and other things that need to be done uh, to make a single euro currency uh, viable? And the answer is absolutely yes. Again, there was incorrect uh, understanding of what the necessary accompaniments of a well-functioning single currency should be, and the euro was introduced as a flawed currency. I think there is now a much greater understanding. The problem is that the moves towards the kind of conditions that would make the single currency an effective, workable unit will take a hell of a long time to introduce, if they can be introduced. And the problem is that the, or the difficulty is that the problems of Greece and Cyprus are here and now and today, whereas the mechanisms that will achieve a more effective single currency are probably 5, 10, 15 years away. So how do we get from over the problems of today into the better uplands of tomorrow? Okay, thank you. My task is to be the timekeeper, uh, and I see that so we're now at a very constraint. Uh, to interpret one of the comments that Daniel um, made, uh, which was basically on the theme that we want the Germans to spend more, but they don't necessarily know how to party. However, the Hellenic Observatory does know how to party. Uh, and uh, I'm about to invite you to come to a reception, uh, which will be in the old building, the main building of the school, in the atrium. Uh, and we'll be able to continue uh, the discussion uh, there. But on your behalf, I think we've all very much appreciated the uh, high quality of the contributions. Thank you for your questions. But can you join me in thanking our speakers? Thank you.